speak to everyone here. So it is my uh, distinct pleasure to uh, start the last session of the day of Osmocosm. And this is the second day on Friday, the 29th of October, 2021, Osmocosm, the inaugural machine olfaction conference coming to you live from MIT and the planet. And um, we have Professor David Carl of the New School and of Cambridge Analytica fame. Um, uh, I think the, the man needs no introduction. We, we as humanity are indebted to him for uh, taking care and, and taking putting in so much effort to protect every single one of our rights online. And uh, I am very heartened to, uh, that he has decided to join us. He's also decided to join our think tank as we develop ethical standards for the technologies, emergent technologies around machine olfaction, that means the sense of scent, and how, when it becomes ubiquitous, the technology that allows you to be able to sniff yourself and others for, let's say, disease, which now comes into something like this, which can fit into an iPhone 10. This is an iPhone 10. You can see how small these things are and how easily they can fit inside of existing technologies such as smartwatches and smartphones. What will the world look like when you are able to avoid, let's say, a, a bathroom stall that somebody just sneezed full of COVID? You can smell it, your phone can smell it and say, don't go into this stall, go into that stall or you might get COVID. Well, that sounds pretty good. What about when you can smell your own moles right before they go melanoma so you don't have to die of a preventable, treatable cancer? Where in many cancers, early detection is the same as cure. And we know that dogs uh, have a, a sense of smell that we can now replicate in the lab in both the sensing parts, that means the primary detection, as well as the artificial intelligence by work such as that performed by Stephen Fowler and others. Um, what does it mean when we can have, each of us can have a, essentially a trained watchdog that can protect us, but at the same time smell other people for things that, let's say COVID is a pretty good idea, cancer starts getting personal. What if I can smell somebody's pregnancy state and what sex they're carrying even before they know it? What if I can smell somebody's anxiety levels uh, or other things that are very personal and private? What happens when we're all carrying these devices in our pockets It is, a, is an interesting new world. What happened when cameras became part of smartphones is the world changed overnight. We have accepted microphones and cameras in all of our devices and the things that we have at home. And now we're having noses come into this play. And the problem is that we're already sensitized and afraid of unwanted spying, unwanted medical surveillance, unwanted ads, all these things. And uh, if we ask the public, as Michael Benson has correctly identified, if we ask the public to add one more thing that will sniff you day in, day out and potentially know such personal things as what you ate, what you drank, what you smoked, um, well, people might just reject it. And if they reject it, we're back to where we started with the pandemics. We'll still be sticking things up our noses instead of using the supercomputer and sensor suite that's available to all of us that's already globally connected. To put this in here is my job, but to understand how that works is everyone's job. And I welcome David Carl here to tell us and sensitize us and hopefully not scare us too much about the hazards that we're facing as well as the opportunities. Thank you, David. Please, you have the stage. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here today. And um, yes, to um, I'm all new to the topic of olfaction detection. I've only recently discovered this, and so I am approaching it from these questions very new and fresh, but the issues are clear as can be even without fully understanding the technology and the implications. And so what I wanna to talk today about is possible ways to approach this. And the interesting thing is I'm not a lawyer. I only know enough about law to cause trouble. And I really come from the perspective of the field of design, particularly UX design um, and previously being a tech entrepreneur entrepreneur myself in the publishing and ad tech space, which is really where I learned how the sausage was made and put me in the position to, um, you know, kind of be a whistleblower of sorts on the practices of industry. And I can certainly remember well before the Cambridge Analytica scandal, I was telling the advertising and publishing industry that their business model was going to blow up in their faces. It was only a question of when. And of course they laughed at me and they told me that nobody cares about their privacy. But of course, a few years later, Cambridge Analytica happened and the entire industry has been in retrenchment and retreat 
since. And so what is the, um, bu the bubbling anxiety beneath the surface that industry will prefer to pretend is not there? And what are the legal implications? And what are the, what are the implications for the everyday person to encounter this? We see precedents and analogs that we need to consider. And so I first start out with this idea of no consent with, uh, I guess it's very important to incorporate uh, puns in a conference like this. So the fake new newspaper, the Sentinel, and it's very important to consider no consent that the, I would argue in this talk that consent as we know it, which essentially undergirds the privacy regimes uh, is about to evaporate. And so how do we contend with uh, this Im imminence? So then um, the fun play on words of me trying to understand what's about to happen, um, that um, and and Andreas and others expect this technology to be ubiquitous uh, sooner than one might expect. And what it's going to do is emanate our information. This is gonna fundamentally transform our sense of privacy because currently we feel some sense of control over what we disclose and that will vanish. And so in the context of losing control and consent, um, how do we deal with subject rights? The idea of a subject comes from the European data protection regime, which I'll talk about. It divides uh, things into categories, controllers, processors, and subjects. Subjects are us, those of us who have personal data that is controlled or processed, and we have basic fundamental rights based on those arrangements. Unfortunately, the subject as a term also has a connotation to feudalism that we are subjects to a kingdom or, or a, a, a regime. And so the question is, how, what is the current state of affairs with subject access rights in the world? What do we learn from the Cambridge Analytica scandal? And would we need to potentially reconfigure how we consider subject? And would we need to consider that subjects have a new preeminence that they have the absolute authority over their data because consent is over. So I want to just um, go to um, the, uh, the movie, The Great Hack, which is on Netflix. And if you haven't seen it, um, one of the important things about the film are the visual effects. The visual effects cost more than most <laughs> entire documentaries cost, but it was important to create a visualization of data as it exists in the current economy. And the visual effects demystified what industry insiders and lawyers and technologists understood. So it was an important step in conveying the complexity to the masses. And what's also interesting in the film is um, the cliche that, um, you know, here's the scene from in the classroom where we ask um, if anybody has ever thought that their microphone is eavesdropping on their conversations to target them with ads. And I think this is very common and it's incredible how most people believe in the conspiracy theory that their microphone is listening to their conversations and targeting their ads because it is much easier for us to understand an electronic ear doing the work that our various data leaking all over the place and being recombined for marketing purposes is un it has an uncanny ability to predict our behaviors. And so uh, when we think of the microphone as this, um, electronic device that makes sense of data for us, it reveals how people need more tools to understand data. And when we emerge into a world where we have electronic eyes, electronic ears, and electronic noses that are ubiquitous, we'll fundamentally change these understandings. And we need to make sure that people do not fall prey to conspiracy theories about how this works. So one of the things that I did with Cambridge Analytica is I was one of these rare American technologists on Twitter worried about data privacy. And so that made me a target to be recruited by Europeans who wanted to test 
the European data protection regime with Cambridge Analytica because they knew that the company was actually a British company. And they knew that if they could find an American to test out the data protection regime, it would be a sort of stress test on the whole system. So I did a subject access request, which is the way that you would exert one's um, rights. And um, I immediately proved that we were dealing with a British company because when I asked for my data, I had to pay for it in British pounds. And I had to pay a company SCL Elections Limited, not Cambridge Analytica. So the even the re process of requesting my data automatically triggered a verification of truth, that just by asking for it, we began the process of discovering. Indeed, the company acknowledged that they were bound by the UK Data Protection Act of 1998 and had an obligation to disclose my data to me. And they uh, disclosed some, and it did have a political model of me. This is what it looked like. It was very difficult to interpret. And so we used section seven of the UK Data Protection Act to have this explained. Because in the European model, when you have in inferences attached to your identity, you have data rights to them and you have explanation rights. And so the company was obliged not only to give me this information, but to provide additional disclosures and additional explanations, which of course they refused. In fact, they famously refused. They famously refused. And in fact, they told their regulator, the UK Information Commissioner's Office, that, and this is an exact uh, quote from documents that I received in, uh, under court order, that I, let me, uh, the, the, the data controller stated that the complainant was no more entitled to make a subject access request under the DPA than a member of the Taliban sitting in a cave in the remotest corner of Afghanistan. So this is the current state of data protection rights in the world. The arguably the strongest data protection laws in Europe and UK at the time, arguably the most well-funded data protection regulator, the ICO, this is how they're treated. This is the attitude um, about uh, data protection and full enforcement that's endemic, uh, not just to Cambridge Analytica, I'm afraid. So what was interesting is um, there was some reports published but ultimately, um, I was unsuccessful in the UK courts in, in achieving a desired uh, re resolution here to get my data. Because ultimately, the company was just able to go out of business, file for insolvency, file for bankruptcy, and it escaped all accountability. And so we can write the best data protection laws and fund the best enforcement. And at the end of the day, the whole system is deferential to business at the expense of individuals. And that essential element is going to be undergirding the discussion moving forward. That, that currently today, if you wanted to create another Cambridge Analytica, make a company, collect the data, abuse it, get caught, go to business, you'll be fine. Um, this is a problem because um, the um, ICO in its final letter um, did a forensic investigation, seized the servers under criminal warrant, conducted the most expensive, elaborate forensic investigation in history, and did not publish a final report, even though they said that they were going to, to explain to Americans how our data was collected, processed, and transferred in violation of the UK Data Protection Act. For some reason that never happened. All we got was a perfunctory letter, but it had one element in it, which is they found, ident uh, they found evidence that the company was in the process of offshoring. <laughs> so they knew they had gotten caught. They knew that they had made a mistake exporting Americans data out of America into the UK, where it then was under the jurisdiction of the regime based on the Google Spain um, decision where basically you get data rights where your data lives. 
And they were offshoring because it was about um, finding safe havens to conduct data abuse as a business model. And that's how we've left things. Indeed, if we look in the Senate Intelligence Committee in the Russia investigation, we see that um, even members of the Trump campaign who were prosecuted by um, the Mueller investigation. So Rick Gates, one of the members of the campaign was convicted of conspiracy against the United States. He too, as you can see here, was concerned that Cambridge Analytica was misrepresenting the campaign, Trump campaign, and was concerned that Americans data was being transferred to the United Kingdom. And the, the own campaign didn't want that. So my worry as a concerned citizen that our data was being exported to another country and the voter analytics industry was becoming internationalized was the same concern that Rick Gates, uh, one of the henchmen uh, within the campaign was concerned about. Um, so these are clear issues. We have not yet grappled with the extraterritoriality of data and the way that data uh, respects no boundaries and emanates like an atmosphere around the world. And so therefore, when olfactory detection comes into ubiquity, this uh, concept will become even more am amplified. And the question is, do we even have the tools to regulate the current system, let alone the next paradigm? So what's interesting is even after all these investigations and so on and so forth, there was a leaker, a whistleblower, who in 2020 leaked the contents of the Trump 2016 database to a reporter. And Channel 4 News uh, out of the UK received the 2016 database and in the lead up to the 2020 election, went to individual voters to show them their Cambridge Analytica voter file. And in this segment behind me is the anchor of Channel 4 going to a uh, voter in Milwaukee in a battleground district and showing her that she has been marked for a deterrence campaign where she has, as a black voter, has been disproportionately marked for deterrence and targeted as an individual with disinformation tailored to discourage her from participating in the democratic process. And when she was told and shown her voter file, her response was, this makes me want to vote even more. A powerful moment where the asymmetry of knowledge is neutralized. That the minute the voter sees their own voter profile and how they've been targeted adversarially, it neutralizes the effect, in this case, deeply nefarious activity to conduct a racist campaign to demobilize voters. And when a voter could see it, the power of that evaporates. So interestingly, uh, they came to my house too, and they showed me my data uh, in the lead up to the 2020 election. And of course, it was so much more than was disclosed to me under the UK Data Protection Act, under the supervision of the regulator. And interestingly, inside of the data, was of course a personality score. And this was despite the repeated denials by the Trump campaign and other those associated with it, the company itself, repeated denials that psychological scores were used in the 2016 election. And yet when the regulator fails to determine that and it takes a leaker and a whistleblower to leak to the press to show the deceptions were rampant. The question is not so much to me whether or not psychological targeting is an effective way to win an election. What matters to me more is, do we have any rights to have any visibility into this? Are they enforceable or not? And is there deception related to it? Like, can we even find the truth of what these profiles are? And so, it, there's a lot of challenges to rise to still to this day. And so when we think about olfactory detection and we think about how 
the American model is fundamentally unprepared for this future. Because roughly speaking, I understand it as castle doctrine versus EU fundamental rights to data protection as a human right. That is in the United States, we're still on this 19th century privacy model that you have privacy in your home and the minute you go outside, it's finders, keepers, losers, weepers with your data, which is basically our model. And it's basically what the Cambridge Analytica scandal abstractly taught ordinary people. And then in Europe, you have fundamental rights to your data when it is attached to your identity. Totally different model. The other fundamental difference is consent. In the, in the, in the EU, this opt-in, and in the US, it is opt-out based on the old, now totally archaic FTC model of notice and choice. You have to have you know, the notice that your data is being collected buried in some privacy policy that no one will read. And the choice to opt out is doesn't even have to be functional or mean, meaningful. It just has to be offered. So an incredibly weak regime, vertical and sectoral versus a horizontal generalized human rights re regime, very different. And in the case of the Cambridge Analytica scandal revealed that the American system is absolutely inadequate. And there are very important merits to the European model. And when we go to olfactory detection as ubiquitous and we lose the capability of consent, then the importance of subject preeminence becomes even more important than it already did, is. Because it took me more than a year of full-time work and more than six figures of legal fees to get where I got and it wasn't even successful. And if it wasn't for a leaker, whistleblower, press action, it would have been an utter failure. So we are still entirely dependent on whistleblowing and journalism. And I believe that whistleblowing is a symptom of a dysfunctional regulatory regime. When people are so frustrated that they whistleblow, everything is broken. So until we are not reliant on whistleblowers, we have a lot of work to do before the world is ready for olfaction detection. That is my talk. Thank you so much, David, for this like food for thought. I think like everybody is right now digesting your words and it's like a huge question that we all need to answer ourselves in this crowd and beyond how, uh, how to achieve this goal in terms of like uh, future standard data, but also like we, we have troubles with the data that we have right now, um, which, is, which is not very optimistic, I would say. Uh, but I like what you say that transparency about the process, about like um, this profiling process, like the knowledge neutralizes the effect. Uh, I wonder if this could be also the case with like gather send data and I would really love to hear from Demetrius but he 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 told me uh, of the record that he's not expert on data law but about like the policy making uh, uh, in terms of uh, these issues yeah um, I, I it's a fascinating topic uh, David thank you I there are a couple of points that I probably should mention. Number one, I think you're right uh, in the sense of how dysfunctional the world is in terms of hiding secrets and moving um, you know, assets, for instance. And let's take the example of the offshore companies. And let's take uh, the example of how people are hiding money in all sorts of different jurisdictions that don't have the schemes. And if it wasn't for a whistleblower, the uh, cases coming out of... Uh, Switzerland uh, would have not been coming out. So I guess this is a human sort of element that uh, humans try to find a way to hide information, to hide assets, to avoid taxation, to do all that kind of stuff. And the second point is I've, I was involved in a whistleblowing case and I have to tell you the regulations in the US are not as easy as people think they are. So even though if you are willing to do this and bring out information, you are not treated with respect. 
And the system is not so simple, even though you've got this amazing information you want to bring out. The system doesn't accept you and says, my God, bring it in. Let's take it into the court system. Let's figure it out. No, you're actually uh, put aside in a way. And we have difficulties even you know, working with people that are willing to come forward. So these are also additional elements to what you have raised, which are serious issues of our failing system. Uh, and I, I agree with you that the Europeans are much more ahead than us. And in the US, my God, I was judging a moot court problem two years ago, and the issue was whether or not someone, the police hovering over a little, you know, helicopter videotaping, you know, images inside a home could actually use that information in a court of law because there was a drug deal or something like that. So the privacy notion that you raised, I think, is even lesser in terms of where the police can go and what they can obtain. So uh, very, very valid points. And I think probably that's the issue for next year uh, with respect to olfaction, all that privacy stuff that needs to come out and the models that we need to develop because we, we're really far behind. Yeah, it, it strikes me that the, the user scenario of olfaction detection capture if it was designed for, for preeminent subject rights, as I speculate it could be, perhaps it would be that the, um, the that, that scans would be mutual. So basically, if you took a scan and there was another device in proximity that the data would be uh, automatically exchanged with the other device so that you would have every scan that was made on you so that at least you knew that proactive disclosure, like that there was some built-in transparency to it. And then if you had jurisdiction, you had that kind of receipt of scan and there might be ways to exert rights upon that retrospectively or, or a way to provision for rights at the point of mutual exchange. Those kinds of things would have to be designed in to be compliant. I found that it was really interesting in the moot court project earlier today, the way that um, essentially blockchain and cryptocurrency was the mechanism of receipt, but I'm not sure if, if, if that's GDPR compliant, but but there are it, 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 there in, interesting you know, things to, to game out. And I feel like as a designer um, and then we see with the scandals of Facebook that designers, especially UX designers, are the people in the organizations who are actually building the, the product and the policy is on the surface. It's, it's built into the design of the product. And if designers is like, you know, that, that a lot of the talk today is that lawyers and engineers and scientists have to be at the table at this early stage. I would argue that designers have to be at the, the early stage too, because the design of the UX of this olfactory exchange, this capture, this data stream um, has to be designed with dignity. And a designer is going to be in a good position to designed for dignity. One of the issues that Andreas and I are always debating, or at least he's the one who brought it out, he says uh, something like, um, we should uh, smell machines, but we should not let machines smell us or something like that, which is an interesting issue uh, as well. So as part of the foundation of Osmocosm, we want to change the dialogue with respect to you know, data protection. And we want to create, I think, the parameters of how that information is captured, where it goes, and the fact of acceptance or consent that you are referencing. And you're right, consent has to be, I think, differently than the way we are handling it in the US. Um, and I, I don't like these, oh, you consent, and then they give you 35 pages of material that nobody reads. Um, you know, it's the click, 
And there are a lot of cases, as long as you click, you accept anything and everything they uh, they have in there. Well, hold it. I accept 25 of the elements they have. I don't accept one. I want to opt out of that, but you can't. Those are extremely valid questions. And um, I think like, uh, I, I would like to thank you all and maybe invite all of us to gather, to gather and talk maybe in like, less formal atmosphere and i will just finish with the question uh that doesn't have to be answered now let's just like marvel uh, around this question mark has like uh, been with us from the beginning of the conference and is uh, helping us a lot with monitoring a chat and he's a design student he asks so how do we start what can we begin to do and uh, and uh, i think this conference um should, uh, uh, I hope, will uh, create some kind of a vision. What can we do for the future? So thank you so much. Uh, we certainly, Carolina, we certainly don't want Congress to make these regulations because they will be influenced by lobbying. Oh, Susan wanted to say something. I'm sorry. Yes, I, I, I did. Um, yes. It's on the issue of what's on the web, OK? Even your information on the web. And I was going to ask David, he pointed out the Republican side. I have some colleagues who there's a, a website which puts reputation. It gives you a reputation score. I don't know if you've seen this. And two of them had a low reputation score on our upstanding citizens. And they tried to do something about it. They went to the Republican senators in our state who said that the Democrats right now, you couldn't get anything through on privacy with that group. OK, so I don't think it's just Republicans. I think it's Democrats as well. And is there somebody in the Senate or in the House of Representatives who could be, who is not so um, influenced by, by money that they have you know, some kind of ethical standards that would try to do something about this? Do you have anybody that you could lobby um, that <laughs> would be more open to, to trying to, to deal with some of these issues? Yeah. I'm I, I appreciate that, and I hear what you're saying, and, and, and I am frustrated by the fact that there's almost no consensus among privacy activists as to the best reform, and there's many specific issues that splinters kind of pro-privacy folk. So that is um, contributing to not having any kind of unity behind any particular bill um, so there's not much, there's no galvanizing behind any one representative's vision for this. There's, there's a lot of fragmentation um, in terms of opposing in industry, whereas industry is very well organized and um, exactly. it's pretty clear on the things that they are against um, and for. So um, I think what I am, what, you know, what is interests me about the osmocosm concept and, and this technology is it potentially creates a reason for the disagreements to, to collapse into a single unified view um, that it, for example, I, like I tried to say, it obliterates the debates about consent. So we can stop debating that and we can move on to the next debate. So perhaps the knowledge of these the urgency of these new technologies could potentially change the discourse around the question that you're asking. Uh, can I add something before we I break up? I think if, um, if we look at consent in terms of the medical field, if you go to the hospital and they wanna draw blood from you, you've gotta provide consent and they gotta tell you all these things and you gotta sign all the forms. If sent, the capturing of a scent is defined as a medical taking of information, then there is a, a very high burden that they've got, to, you know, the medical people have to overcome in order to get that consent. So if we identify the uh, osmocosm as a world of medical information that's coming out of smell, then the standards uh, change. It's a good point. Yeah, and it might be beyond medical, like psychological information. I don't know if psychological might be considered medical, uh, but very good it point. Is. 
Okay. Okay. All right. Let's go together. <laughs> okay. And thank you, thank you all. Thank you so much, all. And uh, if anybody has troubles with getting there, I will just like stay here a little bit longer to assist you. Like the link is in a chat. Uh, so um, I will be joining uh, you there briefly, but for example, probably Nick is there already and he's welcoming you there. Yeah, you have. we have to shut the camera uh, off here in order to be able to join okay. in the other. Okay, go Dimitris, I will be the last to go, like a captain on the ship or something. Uh, we can stop recording, Matt, I guess. Thank you so much.